Yeah, no, it, it makes it, it makes perfect sense because there is a lot of information out there in chess and even at the high levels, it's pretty overwhelming. So the first thing that I would suggest is like um, join a club, join. And if you're local to London, then Aga is your person. She knows every everything and also she's a super person just to get him <laughs> to help you get involved and once you start talking to people they can kind of guide you as well and you can kind of just play Feel you know, that you are not alone. surroundings <laughs> yeah exactly and you can also kind of suss out your style suss out who you like to follow and then you know I, I I'm the big believer of when you're training the more the merrier You've got to make chess social. You've got to make it fun. It's very, very difficult if you're just there in your room and you're having this big book on tactics and you're like, well, where do I begin? Like, how, how do I get going? And uh, the same with end games. It's like, where to start with the end games? Yes, we know it's the basics, but once you've done the basics, where do you progress from there? So it's so much easier to do that when you're with friends and when you're part of a club. Mm. Okay, Anna, we will get back to that uh, as probably uh, later on after the interview that we will have the time for all of us to, to chat and have an exchange. Then for beginning, I would like to thank everyone for joining us in the interview with uh, Jovanka Houska. Jovanka, thank you so much for agreeing and uh, be present today for us. And um, that's really mean a lot for all of us to have you here and hear all the story behind that a uh, huge success um when you know when you look into your uh, cv you can see so many uh achievements that it's really really like wow um you are international master you are chess author you've wrote so many books uh you are commentating now you are nine ta nine time uh, british champion and uh, so many things else that is uh, around. Can you tell us everything, how that started? Um, how did you start playing chess? When was it? And how did you like it? If you like it at the beginning, because that's very important. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Aga. And thank you, Lily. And thank you, everyone, for inviting me here and to being part of uh, this talk and just being a nice friendly atmosphere and thank you Aga for such a lovely introduction as well <laughs> as you know I just don't think of myself as having all these achievements I just think of myself as being me so so <laughs> thank you Aww. um so how, how does how, how did I start playing chess well actually it kind of stemmed from my father he was obsessed with the game and he was himself taught by his father so he was really like hooked on this idea that this chess was a game that he would pass on to his children and that it was a family game and he put in a lot of effort uh, taking first of all teaching me the, the game at first it was always my brother who was the talented one it was also my brother who was the interested one and my father and my brother would go off and play in tournaments together and at some point they needed a reserve and my mother said you know she can play I was quite young at the time and I was like I really can't you know she's intruding on my playtime but uh now are they they made me play this tournament. I did quite well. And then suddenly my father was like, oh, she's quite good. And then from then on, chess became a huge part of our lives. You know, we were competing all the time. Uh, I wasn't much for I wasn't much for reading books. And at that time, I'm quite old. So <laughs> there were no DVDs or there was no internet courses or anything like that. It was just a, a lot of playing. My brother was very strong, so I, he, he would play a lot of blitz against me. And I, I'm not joking when I say it was like Monday was chess night, Tuesday was chess night. Um, we did everything with chess as a family you know and I remember like following some of the world championship games as a family on teletext and it was really driven by my father and his passion and one thing that he had that was quite unusual and I don't know whether it was I don't I would go as far as he did but he was quite adamant because he he comes from Uruguay 
and he was quite adamant about his philosophy in life was that girls and boys were no different. So anything my brother could do, I could do too. And he, he never ever like drilled into me that because I was a girl that I should behave differently. No, you know, he was very determined that we would be outspoken and we would be competing in the best. And he had a philosophy as well where, you know, when I was 10, I would be competing in the under 18 section. Um, and he got a lot of criticism for that because they were like, well, she's going to lose all her games. She's not mm. really strong enough to be playing in the under 18. And quite frankly, I wasn't. But that didn't deter my father. He was just like, let's just do it. Let's just do it. And uh, let's just get better at the game. And it's thanks to him that I actually probably got to the, the level that I am now because he did it, the big groundwork. He put in effort and... He really forced us to read the books. And uh, that's that's how that started. And when I got good, then it became like a, something I wanted to continue. Um, I always wanted to be a world junior champion. And that was something that really inspired me to get better. And I always knew that I could. So I had a quiet confidence with ins inside me. And so when I won the European juniors, uh, sorry, European girls under 20, that was like the culmination of my dream. And when it came to deciding like when I would be a chess professional or not, that was, I have to, I have to admit, I was never one for like having a goal other than becoming an international master and doing the best I can. I was never massively competitive aside from my brother. Um, but uh what I did want to do is I wanted to be the best that I could possibly be. And, and I, I knew that I didn't really want to carry on my education. I didn't quite know where I was going because so much of my life had been chess, 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 that I wasn't quite sure where, or once my law degree was finished, what was I going to do with my life? What special talents I had? And so suddenly I was started playing chess and I was determined, okay, let's become an international master. You're so, so super close. And then from then on, it just kind of spiraled on like that. So. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, Yavi, we have a question here. Did you have mm -hmm. a one-to-one -one mentor and how did you train? Um. So our family had a mentor in the in, in New Zealand international master, Bob Wade. So he was very much a mentor to us. So he would provide a lot of information and when it comes to trainer we we didn't have a trainer at all we were we had we came from very humble means so there was no money in the family for anything other than tournaments so how did we train um a lot of the time it was just playing blitz and a, a lot of playing and i i would listen to what people said about me some some of it was negative. I mean, I had a grandmaster say to me when I was about 16, say, so why do you play so passively? And mm. that's something I feel quite passionate about, that you can give feedback, but you don't have to give feedback in a dismissive way. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, but I, to, because I, I was training with my brother, you know, as in playing a lot of blitz, then I wasn't that fast. But I mean... I would say that not having a trainer in the early years did it does impact me because I had a very limited opening repertoire. It was just basically me freestyling and just playing what my father also freestyled. <laughs> so, um, but I, I there is a lot to be said now that I've had some experience with commentary and also some experience with talking to the elite level grandmasters with playing and. If I were to pinpoint a big fundamental difference between girls now and boys, I would say that the boys play a lot more than the girls. Mm. Um, they And by play, I don't mean in tournaments and things. I just mean in blitz. They're able just to kind of rock up to their friend's house and they are playing hundreds and hundreds of games and freestyling ideas. And this is something because... the when it comes to women and girls, the numbers are much lower. We don't get that same social connection and same social possibilities that, that they do. Yeah. When did you, uh, Jovanka, realize that the chess is your profession, that you would like to do that professionally? 
It, it was when I left university. I didn't quite know what I was going to do in my life and I didn't enjoy law. So I was like, there's no way that I'm going to carry on that. And I was, so I just won the European girls under 20 and I wanted to become an international master because my brother had become an international master. And like I said, I wasn't competitive with anyone other than him, uh, big brother, you know, and so I really wanted to do that. And I met I met my husband, my future husband, and it also kind of slotted in really nicely with my life, you know, and playing chess and trying for this goal. So that's when I decided. But I, I had to, I wasn't, I'll be honest, I wasn't earning any money doing this. So I had to, from, from I think 23, 24, I had to start writing articles to help subsidize. And then around about 25, 26, I started teaching as well. Sure. Okay, next question. How long should someone play chess daily? Um, well, that depends on your schedule. And first of all, I'm I'm a big believer of working smart. So if if for instance you're you know you're awake bright and early in the morning and you feel ready i feel it's a good idea to implement a system so maybe try to get some puzzles some playing then and then see if it suits you because some people obviously they work really well in the morning some work well in the evening so mm. find out what you are best suited to and then work to that and I've I've just been listening to this Atomic ha Habits, um, and he was talking about um, I can't remember the author though. Uh, he was talking about developing a system, and I'm really big believer actually of having that system, so that you can just get one percent better at that system, so that you can keep that going. So recently, because I don't have that much time myself. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm just I wake up in the morning and my plan is to do 50 tactics a day and I'm focusing on some core things so I'm focusing on playing a little bit online and I again I, I'm limited on time so maybe I'll get in maybe half an hour of playing chess and then you know doing some end game study between one hour it depends on my schedule and then when it comes to openings, I, I, I'm again, I'm, I'm of the believer that you can be crafty. You don't have to learn every opening under the sun. That's for the elite level grandmasters. Instead, just get to grips with the position, and then start varying. Keep people like guessing there, so you can kind of kill them with their, your experience. And how do you feel when you play chess? Oh, well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm an honest person, so I'm actually going to be straight off. I think that's um, a good question to all of us. You know, everyone should think <laughs> about this answer. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I do feel nervous and I do feel tense when I play jazz. And I really have to talk, spend a lot of time before the game starts talking to myself, trying to like have have these positive affirmations, trying to tell myself I'm calm, I'm confident, I'm powerful. And then, you know, just to get myself into like a calm state of mind, because really what you want when you're playing chess is you want the kind of calmness and alertness. You want those two together. And if you get that, then you're in the flow and you're in the zone. And whenever I'm in that state, I'm doing well. Like, and I know I can match the best of them. But yeah, it's it's just getting there. And I've learned some tips along the way. Like for instance, um, Benjamin, who, Benjamin Porto, who we worked with in the uh, Olympiad for the English women's team, he gave us some tips. Like for instance, you can regulate your body state just by breathing. So if you're feeling tense, and you're feeling ang anxious, then you can make, you just have to make sure that your exhale is longer than your inhale. And doesn't matter what your mind is saying, <laughs> your, your body has to behave if you, if you regulate your breathing. Now, obviously this requires practice. You can't just, you can't just, uh, just rock up to a chess game and just expect your breathing to fix everything. You have to put in again, the work. Okay, and uh, tell us about the preparation because 
we have some tournaments coming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So Tell us yeah. how you are preparing to the tournament and uh, how it looks like. Okay, so I, I can I can give you my life as a commentator and life before a commentator. So life before a commentator, I was working pretty hard. And I was working maybe four or five hours per day. Um, before becoming international master, I really was like, I would put my watch on and I would time myself. I would work tremendously hard before every game and before every tournament when I was training for the women's world championship I was I'm not a I'm not a good person for like following when it comes to exercise and things but there I was doing a lot of exercise I was trying to toughen up and I was working on my openings uh probably again two hours at least and sharing my information with my friends so serious stuff. Um, now as a commentator, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time traveling and I don't have the time. So I have to just think about where I can fix things. So if, like if I spot a weakness, I will drill down on that weakness and try to make sure that I'm not so predictable there. And then I will, again, I feel like there's three things you have to do when it comes to chess. You have to work on your calculation and you you can decide your time. It, it just If you have an hour, then just split it between calculations, split between end games. And, and when it comes to openings, again, look to your strengths, look to those things that you're most comfortable in, refresh your memory on the sharp lines. And I feel like if you do those kind, those three things, and you just find a system to incorporate them, then I think you should be okay. Um, but, and one thing I have to stress in this day and age, don't be obsessed by the ratings because <laughs> I mean, everyone is underrated and there's lots of juniors who are, you know, putting in a lot of time, a lot of efforts. I mean, just now I played in the, um, in Dusseldorf in the WR, world rapid team championships and i played this kid who is an fm and his fide rapid rating was like 2000 and i was like an fm <laughs> yeah. he's 11 years old with a rapid rating of 2000 no i don't think so no it turns out he was like german germany's like one of germany's biggest talents and his normal rating was like 23 80 close to 2400 so yeah your rating is going to go down and if you, you kind of just accept that then you just enjoy just enjoy the game for what it is okay before we will go to the uh, the questions from the chat that was actually part of my question because we have juniors here as well and uh, what would be your advice for the new generation of the chess players and if they would like to go similar path as you, what would, would be your advice to them? Well, there's, there's a few things that I would advise. And uh, so when it comes to the chess, just work on those those subjects. Uh, there's I would also kind of say when it comes to the mental mindset, it's important to be determined and it's important to find people that inspire you. Mm. And... I would really strongly recommend that you surround yourself with people who are going to put you in a positive frame of mind. If anyone criticizes you, think about the message that they're giving you and then decide whether it's relevant or not. And then I, and if they continue being negative, just get rid. You, I mean, I spent a lot of time listening to people when I was younger who were very negative. And you know, I had a lot of comments when I was younger saying, Oh, I, I wasn't the talented one. My brother was always the talented one. I had uh, other people tell me, you know, that I was young. So why did I not play aggressively? Even though I was having dreadful results playing super sharp chess, they were just thinking, you, you're young, you should do those things. And what, at the age of 27, I finally got myself a trainer and he just looked at me and he said, why on earth are you playing these like super sharp Sicilians when you are fantastic in closed positions and you are great at maneuvering? You are a D4 player. You just don't know it. Who's given you these mm. advices? And I was like, oh, 
I'd never really heard anyone be positive like that before. So we changed and I it, I was amazed because in the next tournament, which was Hastings that I played, he goes to me, you're playing D4. And I was like, but I only know what to do against the King's Indian defense. And he goes, doesn't matter. You, you can freestyle it. It will feel natural to you. And that was great advice. And I'd wish I'd had it earlier on in life. So I, I would say any anyone that ruins sorry anyone that ruins your confidence, you need to think twice whether you want them in your life. Nice. We have Caroline who writes, "Hi everyone, I feel happy." Oh, someone writes, uh, "Excited when I play." For I probably get overexcited. <laughs> <laughs> we all do we all do okay now we have a question actually it's regarding the books which was the in my another questions very soon because what yeah. i wanted to ask which of your books is the closest to your heart which one you would uh, recommend the most uh because every writer have have won the favorite right right yeah um and there is a question are you going to write any more books chess or novels uh, I have your CK book and the novel. Yeah. So, um, so when it comes, so the novel is a very different creature than the chess books. So the 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 novel is a kind of as a project, it was a joint writing project that I did with James Assinger, and that kind of came about a little bit incidentally. He wanted to gift me a wedding present, and we'd done a lot of research um, because we were trying to sell chess to tv companies basically so we've done loads and loads of research we had lots of information we had some storylines and then he was like well, well why don't i write a novel and then it became a huge collaboration collaboration between the two of us you know where i was constantly editing saying this should happen with the plot and and then that's how that one came about and i and this one is it is a very special because i've never done that something like that chess is kind of my familiar ground chess openings but i've never ever put my name or done a project with creative writing and mm -hmm. i was a little bit nervous first of all to do something like that because i remember the words of my english teacher that was like some people can write and she looked at me and she said you Yvanka, can't <laughs> I was like, oh. ooh, <laughs> and I was, yeah, so, I mean, those kind of words were quite impactful, and so to kind of create this project with James made me think, and also, also, it was quite similar, to, I was quite similar to my articles, because I'm I'm quite a light-hearted person, and I always like my chess articles to be that way, and when it comes to my chess books, um, it would have to be one of the Karakhan books because the Karakhan books, they, they, the first one that I wrote was a real labor of love. It took me one year and I was m mega excited. I mean, I can remember working nights and nights in London and, and then the second Karakhan book was an even bigger <laughs> labor of love because I hadn't quite realized how the opening had advanced so much. And I really wanted it to be a book that everyone of all levels could benefit from. And it was also computers were, were becoming amazingly strong. And often when you're analyzing, you just look at the computer and you said, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, it looks good for black. But I, I wanted to make sure that that actually was good for black, that you could feel comfortable playing it. So I would play out this position on a board and then I would drag my poor husband and because he's about 2100. And I was like, do you feel comfortable defending this position? And if he said no, then I would be like, OK, let's not recommend this at all. And so we spent a, oh, I spent over two years of, of working on that book every day and every night. And so I think that that one has the most special place in my heart because it was so much work. And I can I can recall coming up with all these ideas and then Gawain Jones would play in the four and Seattle, and he would literally play them and refute them. And I was like, why are you doing this to me, Gawain? <laughs> but it was a good, it was a good training. 
and actually I feel writing those books helped me so much with the understanding of the caro understanding the basics and it, it does give me the freedom to vary so much in my openings because I understand the pawn structures because I spent a lot of time of my life playing this positions mm. We have a question. Have you ever worked with a mental coach to work mental mindset? Yes. Yes. So um, in twenty in the 2021, uh, Benjamin Porto got in touch with me via mutual friend and he asked whether I was whether I was interested in working. And since performance has always been a problem because I get very excited when uh, it's time travel or nervous. And I just thought, wouldn't it be nice if I didn't have that? you know I didn't have that you know first of all the fight on the chessboard and then on top of that that little voice in my head that I also have to fight against so we started working and I it was really 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 good you know he taught me a lot of tricks and also I thought he was so good that I actually recommended him to work for the English women's team which he did and I really really enjoyed it and I would recommend it to everyone you know I mean it's all the sports that I know of they have mental coaches uh, performance coaches to help them with the mental mindset I just I don't see why we don't have it in chess as well and I think it's very very useful yeah Benji is fantastic we all know him and he's really really great I remember when I played English uh, championship and I actually lost three rounds in a row and he sent me so a nice message because literally I was thinking about we draw the tournament and he put me up you know and that was really yeah. really nice um, we have a question from Zoe do you have an advice on how to overcome the rating deflation at the moment and still progress rating wise um, well, I'm a victim of the rating deflation, so I'm not sure I can give any concrete advice other than just forget about the rating. Because one of the things about chess is really weird, but somehow I've noticed that there's a trend that you know you put a lot of effort into the chess. You you work hard. You 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 really really want to do well, and then you get to the board, and you don't perform. And you lose rating and you're like, how can this be? Because you put in the hours. Why is it not reflected in your rating? Yeah. And this is a problem that I think has happened many times. And some of it's to do with tension that you just can't relax when you're playing chess. And ironically enough, when you stop working so hard and you stop putting the pressure on yourself, you can just relax and enjoy the moment. And, and I have a little story there, like, um, Normally when I play chess, I have a routine and I like to follow this routine. I like to do a bit of an exercise. I like to look at what my opponent's playing. I never spend more than an hour and a half because I've, otherwise it's tiring. And, you know, I have a, an approach, you know, I have certain foods that I will eat. I have like, I'm quite strict with this routine. And one time I was playing in the Fonciao and I know Loz is there. <laughs> <laughs> it is. it's not Loz's favorite moment but uh, it is it is kind of what well, is a really special story to me for not that reason that uh but anyway so I, I I arrived I was actually traveling to England and I decided to play in the Fonciao and uh I, I had to I had to leave at five o'clock in the morning or something so super early and uh, Loz came and picked me up and then I got told that I was playing on board one for the second team with black and we were playing against our first team. And I was like, oh, thank you, Lars. You know, not only have I gone <laughs> up at five in the morning, <laughs> but I have not followed my routine whatsoever. And I get to the hotel and the hotel's like, sorry, your room is not going to be available until 3 p.m. And I was like, thank you. So there was no chance I was even going to have a nap. So I just thought, okay, fine. I'm playing a grandmaster. I have the black pieces. What can I do? I haven't played in a long time either. So one thing that happens is I get to the board, I sit down, within five moves, the alarm has gone off. And we're like, okay, welcome to the four and Seattle. And then at some point, I just relaxed into it. I was like, I know that there's yeah. tiredness, but I'm not going to relate to the tiredness. I'm just going to focus on the game. And 
something weird happened like this calmness came over me and I just started playing and then my opponent blundered a pawn and I just thought okay well it's probably a draw because you're the opposite color bishops but I would just keep on playing keep pushing and then I got so into the the position and the game that I completely forgot about the results and when he came and he resigned I was like looking at him like oh oh okay <laughs> and then much to yeah sorry Lars it was unfortunate because there was the one time that the second team beat the first team and the first team were winning the four and CL and they really didn't want me to win <laughs> I was like oh no but uh in terms of mindset, I think it was a kind of a, a lesson that, you know, if you're too hung up on routines and if you're too hung up on just trying to control the outcome, you're not really going to enjoy the game. So whenever I try and play chess, I think back to that state where I was just focused on the chess and not the result and just practice getting yourself there. We have the comment from Los. <laughs> <laughs> you are forgiven, your your VI black captain. <laughs> I, uh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, how do you feel about your achievements? Because of course you should be very proud of it. You are very humble on all the interviews about yourself. But do you professionally feel fulfilled? Um. Yeah. It's a difficult question because I'm not the kind of person that looks back on my kind of career and go, wow, what you did is amazing. I probably should do more of that, actually. I should probably reward myself and say, hey, that was a good job. Yeah. And then, you know, let tell the body that so the body can actually relax and en enjoy that moment. But um, I'm constantly thinking ahead. And so I, I always have this thing that the best is yet to come. And right now... I, I actually spent this incredible three days in Dusseldorf and I was playing for the chess pensioners and I was in a team alongside Vladimir Kramnik, Peter, Sv Peter Svidler, and <laughs> Lenia Dominguez. I mean, these are like idols for me. And they were so positive and so enraptured by the game that I just thought, you know what? I want to do well I want to get over that rating and I really want to just dedicate some time to playing chess and and I was thinking about my age you know because 43 and I was thinking well what can I do and then I was like okay now you can just see if you can challenge yourself you know to try to improve your memory try to improve your energy levels and keep going forward and that's something that I tell myself a lot so when people kind of highlight my achievements I always I just don't think about them too much if that makes sense and I, I'm always a little bit surprised <laughs> because I'm like oh I, I did I did that yeah and it's not because I I feel that they're insignificant then they're, they're not it's just the way that I am I'm like move it forward keep on progressing learn new things yeah it's it's definitely a lot because okay if someone will win championship once then we can say he's good but he might be also lucky right but if someone yeah. is nine time champion then there is no luck involved <laughs> well i do feel that's the thing and i do feel like you know i i have been lucky at, at times in my life like i remember the very first time i won i i was doing really badly in the event and I had to dig deep I, I was like come on you'll be to give myself a little pep talk dig deep and you can do this doesn't matter if you lose all your rating points don't focus on the title just focus on the games and I think that's what's always happened I've always just focused on the games and it's never been my ambition to win the British Women's Championship title I've always just wanted to kind of get to the championship and do well um, like I, I remember one game I had in 2011 because sometimes in the British I do really well like I come like fifth I don't know in top 10 or something and sometimes not so well and I remember in 2011 that I had like I was playing a really good friend of mine and he had a lower rating than me and I but I really and he offered me a draw when he thought he had the draw and I remember thinking and I was like no I don't want the draw 
I don't want to secure myself a title. I, I actually really, really want to win. Yeah. And I found this amazing resource. I was so chuffed when I when it happened. I was like, yes, I give up a pawn with check. And yeah, so for me, it's more about the games. It's more about like just improving yourself rather than just the titles per se. Yeah, actually, ladies, I need to say uh, your questions are very, uh, it's nice thing because we are going on similar path because all my questions prepared their next one, they are regarding commentary and we just have Caroline who sent a uh, post about the commentary. Your commentary is brilliant too. Well, apart from uh, your play, of course, uh, as in both are brilliant. Um, can you tell us something about the commentary? How did it start and how you are get on, how you feel when you're commenting and yeah, everything yeah. about it? Well, thank you, Caroline. That's very nice of you to say. It gives me a lot of joy to hear that actually because you know playing chess is one thing but commentating is is another because you do put yourself out there and whilst there are very nice comments and you feel really quite really it's really a pleasure to hear those really nice comments there's a lot of negativity as well so in fact here it does matter a lot that someone like Caroline that I know and respect and that you guys say this and so I kind of started commentating I think it's 2017 and the story is quite funny it was at the British Championship a lot of my life happens at the British Championship apparently but um I just lost to I think it was John Ams and I, I just checked open my emails and I saw that there was a, an email from Brian Callahan the owner of uh, the Coletta Hotel and also one of the organizers of the Gibraltar Chess Congress and he was like, hey, why don't you commentate at Gibraltar? The money is good. And I was like, okay. And I was in that mood where I, I'm a little bit, I have this impulsive streak in me. And I was like, yes, just do it. And for years I'd said no, because, you know, I was like, well, what do I bring to the table? I'm not funny. I'm not entertaining. And I'm just an international master. I'm not a grandmaster. So I put myself down a little bit. But then this time I thought, just do it just do it and see how it goes and I was nervous I prepared like crazy I I I wrote like I had the top 10 players I, I wrote down the openings I did a lot of background info, uh, info I watched a lot of the a lot of the old reruns of Gibraltar and then I got there and I was commentating with Simon's so and Simon's a really old friend and yeah he just started the show with welcome back like that in like this big booming voice and then from then on I just loved it and I was surprised about how much I loved it so that's how it started and then from then on I, I've been very lucky in my life you know some things have fallen into my lap uh, you know after that uh, commentary I just thought it was a one-off but then the Grand Chess Tour approached me and they said, we need someone to stand in because uh, Jennifer is on maternity leave. C can you do one show? And uh, I was like, yes, of course. Work with Yasser <laughs> and uh, work with Christian and Maurice. Yeah, I'll do that. I mean, I grew up watching these guys commentate on chess. So I, I, decide, I decided, yeah. And it wasn't until the pandemic happened where I actually... I was invited to be part of the Champions Chess Tour where commentary became a lot more serious and I started dedicating myself to commentary in exactly the same way I was um, com doing chess, for instance. So now I actually prepare for my commentary. I keep a notebook of expressions that I've heard, um, little bits and fact, you know, bits and bobs that I learn about the players, any facts. Um, I, I write it down and I re constantly read and reread my notepad. And uh, one of the things that I would say, if anyone is interested in doing commentary, is first of all, just go out there and just do it. And secondly, don't worry about being bad. Don't worry about making mistakes. We all make mistakes and don't get hung up on those details. And also approach commentary like 
you would a job, you know, understand what the organizer wants from you. Do they want you to bring light relief? Do they want you to be super entertaining? Do they want it to be chess, chess, chess? And who is your market? And then also understand what role you're going to be playing. And I have a, a strong philosophy when it comes to commentary is that you've got to be adaptable and you've got to make your co-commentator look good. And by that, you know, if they make a joke, don't just go, hmm, and then uh, ignore that joke, you know, try to get involved. And if they suggest a strong move uh, or if they suggest a bad move, don't go, I hate that move. It's terrible. No, that's not. I, don't, I feel like that doesn't make good viewing. Instead, what you've got to do is you just got to go, yes, it's, it's a nice idea, but maybe this would work. And I've one of the the statistics that someone told me was that the average person watching chess is uh, rated 800. And when I came at this, when I first started doing commentary, I just assumed that the the average rating of a person watching a show was 1800, but that's not right. And so since then I've been trying to market my commentary for lower levels and just to make concepts accessible. We have a comment. You are a great commentator, especially enjoy watching when you are paired with David Howell and Kaya and Simon. Yeah, they're, they're a fun crew. <laughs> they really, they really are. And uh, a lot of what I've learned is also thanks to Kaya. I mean, Kaya is a tremendous host. I mean, people don't understand like how much she does. She is producing the show. She's deciding the guests. I mean, and she also has someone in her ear speaking Norwegian to her. It's not easy to then announce something in English. And I've had a go this summer at doing the host role. And that was difficult <laughs> because I'm so used to just like talking chairs and talking about strategies, tactics, moves, and, and just showing my personality then to suddenly go, um, now we're going to go to this link to say hello to everyone, to ask questions. It's it's not easy, but it has been a welcome change because I like learning new things. I like testing myself. And, and when it comes to commentary or playing, I would say I like both. And when I'm paired with the right commentator, I, I would be like I'm having the time of my life because I just love talking chess. And I love watching chess. And sometimes it has me on the edge of my seats. Like just now, I've just done Armageddon chess with Simon. And that was a lot of fun. You actually just responded to Zoe. Next question. Do you prefer yeah. commentating or playing? And actually, I wanted to ask, what do you looking forward more to playing or to commentating? Um. I, I I like forward to both. I mean, they're, they're both different. Uh, with commentary, you can kind of relax a little bit more into things. You just feel the tension of the first few minutes because there's always that awkward moment when they're counting you down and then you know you have to lead with something and you have to say something and all attention is going to be on you. And that can feel very stressful. So I usually get over that by just telling myself I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. And then you kind of settle into it and then you just enjoy the games for what it is. And uh, when it comes to playing, you get a massive rush, right? From winning, from finding out the best moves, from kind of trying to get into your opponent's minds and trying to predict what they're doing. And then there's the tension from from the the time trap scrambles I, I'm I wasn't very good at dealing with that I was this is one of the things I would say about being rusty and at the minute I am rusty is that I played well up until the point and then when the clock went down to 20 mm -hmm. seconds oh my goodness me you would not believe the moves that I played they were so bad but uh it's they I mean they give different joys that's how I would say and from our side, uh, Yavi, we need to tell you that it's really a huge honor to have you in the team. And you are such a role model for all of the girls in England and in all countries as a player, commentator, and as a woman, just, you know, achieving that kind of um, achievement. It's it's really amazing. And um, 
what's your what's your next tournament coming I know but the others not <laughs> yeah so I have a mega busy schedule so please look out for me and if you do see me around say hello <laughs> and maybe give me a hug <laughs> because it's crazy it's the European Club Cup so I'm really looking forward to that one so I, I get to play with Wood Green alongside my teammates and uh then it will be from there straight to Qatar Open to commentate. And there I'm also going to be working with one of my really good friends. So I'm really looking forward to that one. And then moving on immediately, I think it may be a one day pause. And then I go to the Isle of Man to do commentary there for the Grand Swiss. And that one's going to be quite epic because, of course, whoever wins there gets a spot at the candidates. And you do feel like you're part of some part of history there. And I also love, love the Isle of Man. So if anyone is thinking about playing one of the side events, just go. It's such a beautiful island and so many things to do. And then I have a, a pause and then I go and play for England, the European Team Championships. And then Sinkfield. Straight away. <laughs> Straight away, yeah. Then the Sinkfield Cup straight away. <laughs> and, and yeah, when the invite came to do the Sinkfield Cup, this was months and months ago, I was just like, yep. They didn't, they didn't even send me a letter. They sent me a contract. And I was like, yep, I'll sign that one because the Sinkfield Cup is just a legendary tournament. Okay, we have a question from Michal. You do work out or anything else to prepare physically for the game? Uh so I have so, so okay so I'm a little bit fickle when it comes to exercise you know when I was training for the women's world championship I was doing some running I was doing a lot of like aerobic exercises um then somehow or other you know I'm not a natural fitness person so then I was like oh yoga is my thing and then I was doing a lot of yoga no, nothing nothing like professional or anything like that just like not even high quality yoga it was just really me just stretching on a mat and probably doing it all wrong and then I've discovered like this Japanese radio workout I read a book by Murakami and you know he was talking about some radio workout that the the Japanese do and I was like, oh, what is that? And then I found out it's like three minutes long. And I'm like, oh, I can invest three minutes in some stretching. And it's a nice, actually gentle stretch to start off the morning. And now I've I've started to introduce, you know, because I, I after this Dusseldorf event, I thought, you know, you'll be to combat aging, you have to and not not aging per se, but just like the energy levels, you have to do some fitness things and so now I've started to try to walk as much as possible and also some strength training to make the cause a core just a core workout so that's what I'm doing at the minute and I'm quite strict with my food as well because I try I try not to eat too much sugar and I try to have as much protein as I possibly can so yeah and I I, I have to I have to do this because not because of of for um it's just for health reasons um I'm quite honest that I have an illness I have an illness that affects my energy levels and every day I take medication for this and I have to really watch what I eat certain foods don't agree with me at all and so they just suddenly I feel sluggish and so I have to just think about what I'm eating so it's normally protein I'm a vegetarian so where I can I will be like tofu beans and keep my iron levels up yeah just to explain you ladies about the how busy calendar of Jovanka is then uh, our idea mine and my colleagues from European and Chess Union the Women Commission it was I think April May when I asked Jovanka when we can have that interview and <laughs> luckily she found the date 22nd September <laughs> a few months later then <laughs> thank you <laughs> but you know the funny thing Aga if you it was really funny because you know 
at the start of the year, I remember at the test boxing, they asked me what was my calendar like? And I was like, I honestly don't know, you know, because I had the chess champions chess tour and then it was taken over by chess.com. I didn't know what was going to be happening. So I was like, I don't know. My calendar is empty. And then somehow the champions chess tour happened. And then I got invited to be Armageddon chess and, and then Norway chess and then Singapore. And yeah, just, yeah, I remember it, it just somehow it just happened. And so. time with chess is going really fast. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. lovely. Um, thank you, Jovanka, for everything you are sharing with us today. Um, we probably will be going to uh, ending very soon. If you ladies have any questions, please uh, feel free. And of course, I didn't start that interview with introducing myself. <laughs> Better late than <laughs> never. For those who doesn't know me, uh, my name is Agnieszka Mileska and I am director of the Women's Chess. Um, I am also part of the uh, Women Commission for European Chess Union and I'm really activist for the Women's Chess and I'm trying to organize as much as possible. If you ever want to get in touch, please do. You have our email address and we will be, uh, everyone who is on the uh, call today, will be informing you about the next coming. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you, Caroline. <laughs> um, yes. Any questions, please always feel free. If you see us on the tournament, please come and say hello. It's it's really nice to, what I always like is to socialize with the people. Um, it's not so many women and girls uh, in chess and we won't really increase that number. And I think if we are all socializing and you know having friends at the tournaments it's really nicer for the rest of us to just comment okay i will be at the tournament you come as well and then you feel already like happier that you have some more company like you know some of us like 30 years ago when we were going for tournament and i was just myself uh with let's say 10 boys i was always feel lonely you know but uh, if i would have any friends who would go to the tournament with me it would be so much nicer. Yeah. Um, Thank you, some... Eka. I was I was gonna say the exact same thing that it's super important. I'm super passionate about this. That you know we have to nurture the social element of chess. We have to make sure that you know the women not just stick together, but we nurture, we connect people as well, and we put people in touch with each other, and just create a very positive environment because. It, you know if things happen it gives us the confidence to speak up it's very difficult to be you know one woman in the room but when there's a lot of us then people have to listen and people have to respect what, what we say and just the net it just the good times and the good times will outweigh the bad times so that's very very important to me so if you do ever see me at a tournament please please do not be shy just come and say hello and yeah what you I'm me what you see is what you get I'm not gonna be like don't you know who I am <laughs> or anything like that that's just not how I roll okay thank you very much to everyone and lovely comments uh, to both of us um, thank you and I think that's time to go yes oh, so quick. okay thank you Yvanka, thank you everyone.